Keeping with our theme, passionate pursuit, went to the dictionary to find out what the dictionary says about passionate. I have my own ideas of passionate, but this is what the dictionary says. Having or showing very strong feelings, being easily moved to a strong emotion. And pursuit is the act of pursuing. That tells you a lot. But it's to follow, to chase, to follow an action, to strive for, to try to get, to seek. And what we heard from our president was uh, a strong emotional feeling of seeking after what God is wanting us to do. And I'm going to use the same text that he used. Uh, the text is from Luke 11, 11 to 13. How many of you fathers, if your son asks for bread, you'll give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, you'll give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, you'll give him a scorpion? You then, being evil, desiring to give good gifts to your children, how much more so will the Father give the Spirit to those who ask? And that followed the teaching on the Lord's Prayer, which followed the teaching on uh, the friend asking for bread and being persistent, uh, followed by the teaching on ask, seek, and knock. But how much more will the Father give the Spirit to those who ask? In preparation for the meet, I need to give you a little bit of testimony. Uh, I've been very, very blessed. I don't know what it is not to be born again. Uh, uh, as a young man, I was told many, many, many times by many, many people that my grandfather got filled with the Holy Spirit, jumped up on the pews, ran across the back of the from, across the top of the pews. From the front of the church to the back and back to the front again, sat down and said, Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, my, my grandfather was a tremendous man. My grandfather, mother had a lot of influence on my life. She did a lot of praying for me. But I first came in, in context with this passage in Luke 11.13 11, uh, in, in 1973 through Full Gospel Businessman Fellowship. Uh, I was a, a traditional Lutheran, taught Sunday school, served in the church board, president of the county Lutheran church men. Uh, as far as religion was concerned, I had arrived. And I felt like I had arrived. But I was doing evangelism explosion, and uh, a friend of mine, I was able to get him back, uh, recommitted to Christ. Uh, a few years earlier than earlier than 73, but in 1973, he and his wife wanted us to go along to a full gospel businessman meeting. So we didn't know what it was all about, so we went. Well, then they gave my wife a book, They Speak With Other Tongues, uh, by the Sherrills. And I had grown up in a church that we would have at least three sermons a year uh, on speaking in tongues is from the devil. Now, we believed in healing, we believed in anointing with oil, but the speaking in tongue stuff, that's not good. So I told her, I said, honey, and she was very obedient, I said, honey, I don't want you to read that book. It's a bad book. When she has such great logic, she said, look, Ken and Dolores are your friends. Would they give me a book that's bad? I said, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. It's coming up to trout season. I'll go out by the stream in the mountains. I'll sit. I will read the book, and I'll take my Bible, and I'll study it. And, and I'll check it out and make sure it's okay for you to read. So I checked it out, brought it back, told her it was okay for her to read. And that was the beginning of a hunger. Well, it took about three months later, uh, about three months, because it was in August of 73. First Friday of August, it was full gospel businessman night again. First Friday was the night. And... I went up after the meeting and I said, I want to be baptized in the Spirit. And the leader said, go home and read Luke, go home and read Luke 11, 11 to 13. I thought, why don't you pray for me, you know? I mean, that's what you're doing for everybody else. But I was obedient. I went home and I read it. And I said, oh, I have the Spirit. 
So I told my wife I was baptized in the Spirit. She said, did you speak in tongues? I said, no, but the Word says I have the Spirit. Well, this goes on until the end of October. And everybody said, are you baptized in the Spirit? I said, I said yeah. I said, I'm filled with the Spirit. They said, did you speak in tongues? I said, no, but it doesn't matter. The Word says I'm filled with the Spirit because God said he would fill me with the Spirit if I ask him. And I've asked him, and I know that I'm filled with the Spirit. Well, towards the end of October, I was praying one day, I was singing spiritual songs, and all of a sudden I started singing in tongues. That led, at the time I was selling photocopiers, that led to a phenomenal four-month run in sales. Uh, I sold out of an office in Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, the company had a branch in Philadelphia, and they had a branch in Philadelphia, and a branch in Baltimore, and for four months, I single-handedly outsold the two branches combined. Brother Eugene talked about abundant harvests, abundant corn. Well, that went to my head, and it didn't last. Uh, but that's where I came from. And over the years, I learned to follow the Spirit and, and walk with the Spirit. And the we started a church in 1990, and the first year we started the church, I read the passage in, in, in uh, Numbers where it says that God says, you shall be holy as I am holy. And that clicked. Growing up, we were taught that that was a legalism, that we had to adhere to the rules and regulations. We had to do this. We had to do that. We couldn't do this. We couldn't do that. And it clicked in me. That's God's promise, not his threat. And when I understood that that was a promise, and, and Judson Cornwall was one of my mentors, and so I wrote him a letter, and I said, asked him, is this what that means? He says, absolutely, that's what it means. The church teaches it out of context. God is saying that because I'm his child, I can't help but be holy. It's in my nature, it's in my DNA, and so I want to be I, I want to become holy. And so I've been on this quest for for worshiping and sitting with the Father. And earlier today we were sharing with some people about Watchman Nee. Uh, I saw Brother Gerald had a book for Watchman Nee that was given to him by uh, by Rick Janico. I, I keep wanting to say Gianico, but it's Janico. Yes. Uh, but but I told him that Watchman Nee wrote a book called Sit, Walk, Stand, a discourse on, on Ephesians, that we've got to begin our ministry sitting at God's throne, uh, being in intimate fellowship with him. And as we get into that intimacy and into that fellowship, we can begin to, we can begin to walk with him and walk the way he wants us to walk. And after we've learned to walk with him, then we are capable and mature enough to stand against the enemy. Tremendous book. I recommend it wholeheartedly. But anyhow, this whole process led me on a quest for worship. And I come, came to understand that worship was addressing God, talking with God, being with him, uh, giving him accolades for who he is, not for what he has done. That's praise, and there's a time for praise. But if you're going to be intimate, it only happens in worship. Most people don't want to go there. We've had people who came to our church, and they say, what you have here is something special, but we're not ready for this. Because when you get intimate, you begin to get exposed. Back in January or February, I'm not sure which, but we were worshiping one day, and I was leading in worship. We were talking about uh, the attributes of the Holy Spirit in relationship to a ship. And all of a sudden, I heard God say, you need to teach this at your next, at your next regional. And I thought, is that me? So after we were finished with our worship time, I asked the church, is this me here saying this, or, or do you think this is God? And unanimously they said, no, no, this is God. They need to hear what you've been telling us for 20 years. 
And so, and so I began to do this study on the ship because I, was, I saw the Holy Spirit as my ship of life. And so I started studying all the aspects of a ship. Now, I'm not a sailor. I'm not a fisherman. I'm not a boatsman. I, I've been on a sailboat one time, and that was in dry dock. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the Star of India was formerly the Bismarck, which was uh, Kaiser Wilhelm's uh, uh, ship of state. Uh, and it's in, in the San Diego Harbor. It's a beautiful, magnificent ship, and we toured. And, and so I ha- knew a little bit about a ship. Uh, but I began to see the different aspects of this great sailing vessel as the characteristics, the character of the Holy Spirit. And when they're building these big vessels, the first thing they do is lay down the keel. It's the most important part of the ship. The keel is the backbone of the ship. It, it, it's a, the skeleton all of the skeleton is built around that. It comes part of that. And so I began to see the Holy Spirit as my keel. The keel is what keeps the ship from falling over. It helps it to stay upright. If it didn't have a good keel, it's going to try going its side, and uh, you're not going to be, it just isn't going to work. And so why should I expect to be able to work in the kingdom if I don't have a good keel? If the Holy Spirit is not at the basis of what, everything I'm trying to do, I'm going to be leaning over sideways. I'm going to walk like a drunken sailor, and people aren't going to want to listen to me. I'm not going to have anything to say. And so the Holy Spirit is my keel. And then attached to the keel is the hull of the boat. The hull of the sides of the boat, what we see, it's what enables the boat to float. It's what enables it to displace water, and it gives it its buoyancy. And the Holy Spirit gives me my buoyancy. No matter where I go in life, no matter what obstacles I find, the Holy Spirit allows me to sail through them when I put my confidence in the Holy Spirit and not in myself. And so the Holy Spirit is my buoyancy. The Holy Spirit is my vessel that transports me in ministry and in life, both secular and spiritual. It's all one. Without the Holy Spirit, I cannot do it. When we look at a sailing ship, uh, most of what we see is what is called rigging. It's the, it's the, the, uh, assemblage of the sails and all the lines that go to it and the, the masts. The whole thing that we see that we that immediately we know this is a sailing ship because we see the rigging. It's what we see. And it's what we associate as being part of the of the ship. But the masts are those big timbers that go up. And on a larger ship you'll have three, possibly four. And the main mast uh, is the largest one, and it's always the second from the front. The front one is called the foremast. And the one that's third in line is called the mizzen mast, and the last one is called the jigger mast. And they all have different functions. They all have their purpose of holding the sails so that you can go. Now, these masts go from, from, from the top mast. They go all through the decks, and they're anchored to the keel of the ship so that they have stability. And these cords that hold the mast together... Uh, are, are called uh, either uh, either uh, a standard uh, either standard rigging or running rigging. The standard rigging keeps the mast stable so that it can withstand the forces of the sails. So the Holy Spirit is my standard rigging. It enables me to withhold whatever forces are coming in, and no matter how hard the enemy's winds blow, they will not tip my mast to deter me from sailing on my voyage. The running rigging is what is used to manipulate the sail so that you can go the direction you want to go and catch the wind as you want to catch it. So we have this massive structure, and its whole purpose is to hold the sails and keep the sails in the right position. The Holy Spirit is also my sails. The Holy Spirit, the sails are what catches the wind so that we can propel the vessel. Without these sails uh, properly in tune, you're not going to go anyplace. You're just going to meander across the waters. And 
maybe make some progress, maybe not. Maybe even go backwards if they're not uh, properly, uh, properly, properly set. The first sail is your main sail or your course sail. And each of these masts are going to have at least three sails. Sometimes they could have as many as six, depending on how large the vessel is. But these sails are all positioned so that working together, they catch the wind at its maximum force to give you the maximum thrust. And when, I, and when my Holy Spirit is my sails in my ship of life, then I have the maximum force, the maximum thrust. And there isn't any place I can't go or anything I can't do because it's the Holy Spirit catching the wind. Now remember, the wind is also the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us it came in like a rushing wind. And so the wind of the Spirit catches the sails of the Spirit and propels me on my life and keeps me focused on Him. The minute I lose my focus, I'm in trouble. The minute the sails aren't trimmed properly, we're in trouble. And so the Holy Spirit is my ship of life. These rigs, these uh, masts that have these sails also have sails for calm winds. Sometimes the winds are very calm and you just want to meander. These sails are called studding sails and they're off to the sides of the mast. They're not attached to the mast. They're additional sails. Uh, and they uh, will be used if you're just trying to go on a leisurely, on a leisurely ride. So these studding sails are all a part of the, of the whole sail package, the whole package of the Holy Spirit catching the wind, catching the power of God. Now the ship also has what they call decks or floors. The very first floor of the ship, and these floors will go from the bow, which is the front of the ship, to the stern, which is the rear of the ship. And the first floor is the, called the hold. The first deck is called the hold. And the hold is where the cargo and the, uh, is carried and where the ship's storage is carried. And as we go in our life, there's lots of things that God asks us to carry. The word says we're supposed to carry one another's burdens. And so we need a place to carry that. We need a, a hold we need a, a deck. We need a place to store all these things. We need a place to put them that, that we can help others, that we have what somebody else needs. You don't know the provision that you have for someone else until you come into place where they need it. I remember one time in church, we were, God gave me a word of prophecy. He said, if you don't have it, you don't need it. Totally changed my life. I stopped getting rid of wanting everything. And, look, and looked at what I had and was more thankful for what I had. And what I didn't have no longer mattered. Because when I needed it, I would have it. And that's, over the years, that has proved so often. If I don't have it, I don't need it. But anyhow, the hold is where all the cargo is stored. Where the, uh, where the uh, ship supplies, the things that the ship needs to work. That's where they, that's where they store them. Then between the hold and the main deck, the main deck is the deck that you see, the deck on top where everything is ever situated, where you, where the the uh, sails are anchored to, or the rather the masts where they're anchored to. But between them, there is a lower a lower deck. The lower deck would typically house the galley, uh, the carpenter shop, the repair shop, the physician's shop, uh, the crew's quarters, and this is. The this lower deck is where all of the support is. The Holy Spirit surrounds us with support. We heard Brother Eugene talk about what happened in, in Kenya. Did, did he do that by himself? No, he had, he had support. The Holy Spirit was there on that lower deck with all of the support that he needed to get all of that stuff done. The Holy Spirit is always there. The Holy Spirit always gives us the support we need to do what he shows us he wants us to do. Our problem is we don't want to rely on the support. We don't want to allow the support to do it wrong. 
according to our, our vision. We don't want the support to make mistakes. Well, we have to give all of that up. And we trust the Holy Spirit. This, this, this lower deck is the Holy Spirit's deck. That's his support. That's what he's bringing to help us. And we need to tap into that and allow that to happen, allow that to work. Allow people to interpret what God shows them to do. He would show somebody else how to do it differently than he'll show it to me because their personality is different. Their talents are different. They have to do it differently than me. And I cannot put so much control on that they, that they cannot be free to do it. And so they are the lower deck. Now, sometimes there's an extra deck between uh, there, and they call that a tween deck. It's used for various purposes, more of the same. Uh, but then there's a gun deck below the main deck. Gun deck is there so that they have defense. If Paris would come aboard, come to the cargo ships, uh, the cargo ship needed to be able to defend itself. And so they had a deck that was just filled with armament. You know, there are times in our walk that we need some defense. The Holy Spirit will defend us far better than we can defend ourselves. Uh, when I was younger, I was quick, very quick to defend myself. My wife used to say to me, who died? <laughs> you know, let it alone, Earl. It's not, it's no big deal. Well, it, I'm stubborn. It took me a while to learn. But the Holy Spirit kept working on me. And now, uh, I don't have to defend myself. If somebody says something about me, so they say something about me. It's no big deal. The Holy Spirit has my back. The Holy Spirit is my gun deck. And, you know, when people start to tangle with the Holy Spirit, they usually don't win. <laughs> and so I've learned to follow the Holy Spirit as my gun deck. I don't have to de defend myself. It's okay. It doesn't matter. And then we have the main deck. The main deck is where we do all the management for the, for the sailing, where all the, quote, activity happens that everybody sees. It's a very, very busy place. But that's our everyday life. Our everyday life is a very, very busy place. And we've got to learn to let the Holy Spirit be in charge of that. Be our main deck. To just flow with Him in the everyday things. And not be concerned about this and that and something else. Just continue to walk. Sit, walk, stand. Continue to walk. Walk the walk that he's shown you to walk. Don't try to walk somebody else's walk. Don't try to do somebody else's ministry. Do your ministry. Be on your main deck, your ship of life. Let your main deck be where God takes you to be. On the main deck, there's what they call the superstructure. That's, all the, that's everything else that's not tied to the sails and the masts. Everything else is called super deck. But on that super deck, or superstructure, is a, a deck called a quarter deck. It's the next, the quarter deck does not run the full length of the ship. But it's the length, it's the deck where the ship's officers live, where their quarters are. Interesting, that is called a quarter, quarter deck for the ship's officers. But we have, in our ministries, we have people on our boards. We have people uh, in leadership that are there alongside us to do the ministry. Uh, they are all part, they are all part of the quarter deck. And we need that in our ministry. And, and the Holy Spirit is our quarter deck. We, the Holy Spirit will bring the people around us that we need to accomplish the vision that he put within us. If he wasn't going to do that, he would never give us the vision in the first place. We have to trust the Holy Spirit to walk in the vision that's laid before us. And so all of our officers who are going to help us, they're stationed right there, right close to all the activity on the quarter deck. And then occasionally there is a shelter deck. If there is no shelter deck specifically, the main deck serves as the shelter deck. But the shelter deck is a deck that its sole purpose is to protect the people from the elements. The Holy Spirit protects us from the elements. 
The Holy Spirit protects us from what's going on all around us, uh, allows us to walk straight through the storm as our shelter. The Holy Spirit is always with us. And then I couldn't find a whole lot of information on this, but the very, very topmost desk at the very, very most farthest part back on the ship is called the poop deck. I could not find any real information on that, other than that's what it was and that's where it was. But part of this superstructure is where the wheelhouse is. That we typically we call it a bridge, but that's the place where the where all the steering mechanism is held. Uh, the helm is called the steering wheel. I'm sorry, the steering wheel is called the helm, and all of that navigational direction uh, equipment is there. And the Holy Spirit is our navigation system. Uh, tells us where to go. Shows us how to get there. Does all the steering. Gets us where we need to go when we need to be there. It also is attached to the rudder. The rudder is what gives the ship its direction. Shows it which, which path to follow. Now... The rudder working together and the sails working together allow the ship to get to its proper destination. But it doesn't get there without a pilot. Now, our pilot is Jesus himself. The Holy, working with the Holy Spirit, the, the pilot is guiding the ship. The definition of a pilot is an especially knowledgeable person qualified to navigate a vessel through difficult waters. And so this pilot will take this ship and enable the wind to blow directly in my face and allow me, by putting this angle of the sails properly and the angle of the rudder properly, allow me to sail almost straight to the back of the room. But only a knowledgeable pilot can do that. If I were left to do it, I'd be all over the place because I don't know the first thing about sailing. But, but a knowledgeable power can sail directly into the wind because of proper navigation tools. Now, this ship is also equipped with certain types of equipment. Uh, it's equipped with what is called blocks and block and tackle. A block is nothing other than an assembly of one or more pulleys together. That's a block. But when you put two blocks together with rope in between them, it's called a block and tally, block, uh, a block and uh, block and tackle. And what that enables you to do is it enables you to lift gigantic amounts of weight. And there would be a passageway from the top of the ship to the bottom of the ship down to the hold, so that they could maneuver the cargo, or maneuver whatever else they needed to do. And they would have these at various places. But the block and tackle, and the Holy Spirit is our block and tackle. Enables us to do things that are impossible for us to do on our own. Leverages, leverages the finite ability that I, that I have to the infinite ability of God our Father. That's the Holy Spirit that I serve. That's the Holy Spirit that works in each and every one of us. And we need to learn to recognize that and allow it to happen. So often we hold back because we just can't see the vision that big. And so we are reluctant to let the whole block and tackle work. Some other equipment is rummage. Now, most of you ladies are probably involved in a rummage sale at some point in your life. I never knew where the word rummage sale came from until I started doing this study. But rummage, at the, when, they were out to be, when they were out to sea and they were transporting cargo, sometimes in a storm some cargo would get damaged and the people wouldn't accept it. Or sometimes they'd get to the destination and the people changed their mind. They didn't, they didn't want what they had subscribed to get. And so this was left over. They didn't want to carry it back to where they went, so they would go out on the, on the dock and they'd set up a rummage sale. They would sell those things that were no longer needed. I remember my first experience with a rummage sale was in the Lutheran church, and my mother-in-law was in charge of it, and I was being all righteous, and I said, why do we do a rummage sale? Why don't we just give these things to these people? 
you know, you know we're, 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 we're supposed to take care of the poor. Why don't we give them? And she said, Earl, you don't understand. At that time, 10 cents was worth $10 today. But she said, if, if I allow a person uh, to buy a nice suit for 10 cents, they walk away with dignity because they bought it. If I gave them that suit for 10 cents, there would always be resentment as taking a handout. And it totally changed my mind on a rummage sale. But anyhow, now I know where the term rummage sale came from. So rummage sales are good things. We should not look at them as fundraisers. We should look at them as ministry to the poor. And when we see a different focus and, and see the real purpose, uh, it change, helps to change our mind. The other thing I found interesting was part of the equipment of a ship is the slush. Now, we've all, we're all familiar with a pro, a, an item called a slush fund or a petty cash fund, but we call it a slush fund. Well, slush, slush was the fatty material that was gathered by scraping the barrels that the meat was shipped in putting boiling water on it to get all of it. This was a grease, a fatty, greasy substance. It was also derived by uh, skimming off the top when they cooked meat for, for the meals. And they would gather this and they would hold it. A slush was very important on a ship because with all of this rigging that you use, there's moving parts. And the slush was used to grease it. And the slush was used to keep the pulleys greased. And so the Holy Spirit is my slush. He keeps me oiled up. He keeps me greased for work. He keeps me moving. With, without slush, the ship can't go anyplace. Something so insignificant. So the Holy Spirit is my slush. And so all of these aspects of the ship, of when I'm worshiping the Holy Spirit sometimes, I will just use these different aspects of the ship and say, you are my slush. You are my hold. You're my rigging. You're my sail. Uh, and I just get so in tune and, and the Holy Spirit will begin to show you things, show you how to do things, give you wisdom that you never knew you had. You, you don't have it because it's his wisdom. But, <laughs> but, you, become a, but you become a receptor. As we plug into the Holy Spirit, we become receptors for what God has for us and what God does for us. Now, the one thing we don't want to become is a hold. A hold is a ship that's been stripped of all its rigging, stripped of all of its working gear, and is no longer seaworthy. It's not going to go anyplace. It's going to sit and dock. And it was typically used as a prison, sometimes used for offices, sometimes used just for storage that you don't need, excess stuff. But a hold is not a navigational ship. It used to be. How many people have we seen that used to be navigational in the Holy Spirit and something happened and they got a burr under their collar and they become useless. There are now a hold. Uh, and, the, and all they're good for is a prison. And they themselves are the ones who are in the prison. God doesn't want that for us. God wants us to be a sailing ship. He wants to be a ship of fellow ship. Disciple ship. Holy Spirit wants to be our ship of life, wants to take us on a journey that is going to benefit others and most of all, benefit us. The Holy Spirit wants us to live to our potential. And if we don't plug in to the Holy Spirit, we're never going to make it. Luke eleven thirteen. How you being evil know how to good give, give good things to your children. How much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Amen. We need to ask. 
Ask for the Holy Spirit's direction, guidance. Ask to just spend time with the Holy Spirit. God will do remarkable things. Our passionate pursuit will become contagious. People will say, you know, how do you do that? I don't know how I do it. Eugene said, I don't know how I did it. The Holy Spirit showed me. I did what the Holy Spirit showed me, and here we are. That's how I did it. That's all God is asking. He's not asking us to be superhuman. He's asking us to be vulnerable. He's asking us, as you, Pastor Eugene said, be obedient. Just to be his. Years ago, in worship time, God said to me, if you will just be, I will do all the doing you can handle. <laughs> he just wants me to be his. He doesn't want me to do everything. He just wants me to do the things he shows me to do. Because if I do everything, I'm going to get tired and worn out and burn out. I used to read about all of these pastors who got burned out. I thought, why are they getting burned out? Sunday's my most exciting day. I, I feel so refreshed after a sermon because the Holy Spirit is doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm just there. But he wants us to be his. If we will just be his, if we will just spend time sitting with him, if we just spend time focusing on the Holy Spirit and seeing the different aspects of, of him as our ship of life, There's nothing going to stop us because the Holy Spirit is the wind that drives. Like a mighty rushing wind, he came in and changed things, changed things. And he wants to do change in us. And he wants us to stop resisting and just allow ourselves to, crawl, to sail across the waters of life with the Holy Spirit, our ship of life. Amen.